modern era wargamers everywhere. This is Oriskany, welcoming you to our inaugural episode of the Op Center, part of the expanding content rolling out for the SITREP channel on Podbean, YouTube, on Tabletop.com, iTunes, and other platforms. So if you're familiar with the SITREP, you know that we cover all things related to modern wargaming. Within that sphere, this new Op Center series will focus on a historical viewpoint of conflicts around the world after 1945. We hope to present a new episode every two weeks or so between our normal podcasts and other SITREP content like Close Quarters Battle, Present Arms, Breach and Clear, and so on. So I chose 1945 as a benchmark, not based on any technological parameters. I mean, much of today's military technology can readily trace its roots back through World War II but more from a perspective of strategy and doctrine. Obviously, 1945 heralded the atomic age, and thus the end of Clausewitzian ideas of total war. After Hiroshima, all war has to be limited, restrained under the ages of the United Nations, the Cold War, and populations far less patient in a time of television and later internet media. So as the name suggests, The Op Center will also take more of a command-level view of wargaming uh, these modern-era conflicts. We'll be discussing how various game systems interpret conditions of the conflict under review, and a little bit of the strategic and even geopolitical background, just so we can get the best possible scope of the war's context, and what it has meant to the world in which we live. Which brings up one more quick point. Uh, We'll obviously be dealing with modern warfare in this series, up to including currently ongoing conflicts. I realize this isn't material with which all wargamers are always comfortable. Just please know that we will always be as respectful and as impartial as possible. Furthermore, when dealing with conflicts this recent, just please bear with us, because you know reliable military data isn't always the easiest to come by. With that said, let's get stuck into our first episode. We'll debut the Op Center with a series of videos looking at wargaming in some of the Arab-Israeli wars, starting with the 1956 Sinai War and running all the way through to the present day and possible developments for the future. So let's start by unpacking the Sinai War of 1956, fought primarily between Israel and Egypt in October and November of that year. So the Sinai War took place in October and November 1956. Israel had only been established as a state for less than a decade, and to win her independence, she'd had to fight a bitter war against the armies of five neighboring Arab states. Now, the popular image of fledgling Israel as this kind of tiny David surrounded by hostile Goliaths is something of a myth. I mean, after all, Arab states like Egypt, Syria, and Jordan were also newly independent and trying to scrap together governments, economies, and militaries. But it can't be denied that Israel was a small state under threat in a very unfriendly neighborhood. Egypt, in particular, was really growing quickly in power and not about to forgive or forget the War of 1948-49. to The situation grew worse when the British-installed king of Egypt was ousted by Army Colonel Gamal Abdel Nasser. The now President Nasser saw himself sort of as the leader of his pan-Arab nationalist movement, vowing to destroy Israel and taking an anti-Western posture in response to their exploitation of Middle Eastern oil and their support of Israel. Contrary to popular belief, he didn't actually turn Egypt into this sort of Soviet client state, even in a military sense. The atheistic elements of Soviet communism would never fully be accepted or absorbed by a predominantly Muslim culture. So instead, Nasser hoped to uh, hope that his pan-Arab coalition, so to speak, would you know sort of hold the Soviet bloc at a cool distance, accepting limited military aid in return for acting against the interests of Soviet rivals in the region. Since Israel had been established, Palestinian refugees had settled into camps along the borders of neighboring Arab states, certainly including Egypt, especially in the Gaza Strip. These soon became nesting grounds for the paramilitary Fedayeen with all kinds of terrorist raids, artillery barrages, and rocket attacks launched out of Egypt into Israel. 
While not directly responsible, the Egyptian government was all too happy to turn a blind eye to these activities, never police these areas, and even lend a limited degree of covert support. Long story short, by the mid-1950s, Israel wanted to invade the Sinai and eliminate these Fedayim themselves, but felt they couldn't take the risk without international support. Other nations also wanted to move against Nasser, and they soon found friends in Israel. These included Britain, which had once ruled Egypt as a colony and later as a protectorate. They hadn't taken kindly to being ousted by Nasser. The French were also itching to take a crack at Nasser. They'd been trying to shake off the stigma of their defeats in World War II, and post-war French militarism had so far only led to further defeats in places like Indochina. And we gotta remember the disaster at Dien Bien Phu had only taken place two years ago at this point. Now, Nasser was agitating and supporting the FLN. This is an anti-French Arab revolutionary group in Algeria. And the French were again spoiling for a fight to stabilize their colonies in Africa and also for a chance to militarily redeem themselves. Finally, everyone got their chance in the summer of 1956 when British troops were finally pulled out of the Suez Canal Zone. British civil authorities were supposed to maintain control of the canal, but Nasser moved in and nationalized the canal, claiming sovereign control of one of the world's most important stretches of water. At last, Nasser had gone too far. Israeli, British, and French planners collaborated on a military and political plan of confounding complexity, but one which would give all of their militaries just enough political cover to carry out simultaneous invasions of Egypt. The Sinai War was on. The Israeli invasion of the Egyptian Sinai was called Operation Kadesh and involved simultaneous ground assaults and airborne drops deep behind Egyptian army positions. The objectives were to defeat the Egyptian army and eradicate Palestinian Liberation Army and Fedayeen enclaves in the Sinai, especially in the Gaza Strip. Meanwhile, British Royal Marines and French paratroopers would also have their boots in the sand with Operation Musketeer, landing at Port Said at the north end of the Suez Canal. Depending on Egyptian resistance and reactions at the United Nations, additional forces were also ready to expand the invasion into Alexandria if necessary. Just in the plan for Operations Kadesh and Musketeer, we see some key features of post-1945 coalitional limited warfare. Clearly, the British wanted Nasser out of the canal, the French wanted to end Nasser's agitation in Algeria, and the Israelis wanted a chance to clear the Fedayeen out of the Sinai. Everyone wants something different, but they're able to come together and come up with a plan where everyone can get what they want. Furthermore, the political fallout at the UN it isn't just taken into account, it's a key feature in the plan, not only in determining how each faction rolls out their part of the invasion in turn, uh, of course each one loudly decrying the aggression of the other as they go, quote unquote, but also in how each of these factions know that they won't be allowed to stay in the invaded territory. After they accomplish their mission, they don't need an occupation plan or an exit strategy because they know ahead of time that the UN will demand they withdraw anyway and peacekeepers will have to clean up the mess. It's war by ceasefire, something that we're going to see over and over again in the course of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Ironically, UN restrictions against this kind of war are a big part of what makes this war possible, or at least easier to plan in the short term because everyone knows going in, there will be no long term. So this discussion will focus on the Israelis and Operation Kadesh. Operation Musketeer could easily be its own video. Now when generals realize they can't hide the scale of a military buildup, what they'll often try to do is disguise the intended direction or target of an imminent strike. The Israelis did this in the lead up to Operation Kadesh by mounting operations against Jordan most notably a tank and paratrooper raid on the West Bank police fort at Kalkilia. Late on October 29th, the Israelis hit the Sinai in force. First came a near suicidal mission of Israeli P-51 Mustangs, these are piston fighters left over from World War II, flying low enough to clip Egyptian communication lines with their propellers and wings. 
right behind this, we have 16 Dakota transports escorted by British-made Meteor fighters, dropping a battalion of 395 paratroopers at Midla Pass, a key choke point through the rugged Sinai Mountains, 156 miles into Egyptian territory. Meanwhile, the Israelis hit the Sinai border on the ground in two major attacks, Abu Aguila in the north and Quintilia in the south. The overall objective of these assaults was to crack the Egyptian defenses and open up the roads leading west toward the Sinai Mountains, where again, those paratroopers were holding that key pass at Mitla. Once through the Mitla Pass and the Bir Gafgafa Pass just to the north, the Israeli columns would presumably engage Egyptian reserves based near the canal. This is assuming, of course, that these reserves weren't already engaged by the British and the French. But please remember, the Israelis weren't exactly counting on the British and the French. They didn't fully trust their allies to carry off Operation Musketeer in the face of too much United Nations outcry. Once the defeat of the Egyptian army was underway, the Israelis would then launch a third ground attack along the extreme northern shoulder of the Sinai, cutting the Mediterranean coastal roads and destroying PLA and Fedayeen enclaves in Gaza, Rafah, and Khan Yunus. The Israelis, of course, were relying a great deal on speed and surprise. In all, the Egyptians outweighed them in the Sinai by as much as 4 to 1. And while the Anglo-French invasion could be expected to draw off a great deal of this firepower, Operation Musketeer wasn't scheduled to start until a full two days after Operation Kadesh. This was to allow for an appropriate and exceedingly well-scripted diplomatic outrage and deniability on the floor of the United Nations. So the Israelis knew that at the outset, they would be on their own. The Egyptians, for their part, were very good at fighting from prepared positions. Their troops were experts at field fortifications, setting up blind angles for anti-tank guns and recoilless rifles, reverse slope defenses, mines, wire entanglements, and other field works. Egyptian units fight well when things are going according to plan and the enemy is approaching from one of several predicted directions. This, plus the Egyptian advantage in numbers, makes any Israeli frontal assault on an Egyptian position virtual suicide. Accordingly, Israeli units resolved to make the most of their key advantages, that's mobility and a much more flexibly trained officer corps. The Sinai is a vast, open desert, and the Egyptian army of 1956 couldn't hope to present a solid line of defense. The Israelis thus would strike through gaps in this line, and this is actually much harder than it sounds in a desert with no roads and with no GPS in those days, or really even reliable maps. Also, please remember that these gaps were often covered by minefields and Egyptian National Guard outposts. Once through, however, the idea was for the Israelis to turn and strike these Egyptian hedgehog positions from the flanks and rear. As the Israelis would find at battles like Abu Aguila, however, this was often much easier said than done. Israeli army equipment in 1956 was a true garage sale mishmash of gear scraped together from anywhere it could be procured. Remember that the state of Israel was only eight years old at this point, and its military was run on a shoestring budget drawn from a small fledgling economy. Starting with small arms, we have a very eclectic mix. Some of the very first Uzi submachine guns were used here, still with the rather archaic wooden stock. Many wartime photos, however, show Israeli troops still with the British wartime Sten submachine gun. British Enfield rifles were also very common, although the FN Fall battle rifle was just coming into Israeli service on a pretty limited basis. Most heavier Israeli equipment at this time was coming from France. These initially included third-hand French Shermans, originally lend leased from the United States during World War II. The Israelis were quick to upgun and modernize these as best they could, at least to what they called the M1 Sherman. This is basically equivalent to the American Easy 8 variant at the end of World War II. As 1956 approached, more Sherman imports arrived and were further upgraded with new features. These included the very high velocity French 75mm gun mounted in their post war AMX 13 light tank. Ironically, this was a gun originally copied off of the German Panther tank of World War II fame. The 
there were also still some truly vanilla Shermans with the original 75mm dual purpose guns, or even the 105mm assault howitzer, which would be useless against Egyptian tanks, but very effective against entrenchments and artillery positions. The French also supplied moderate numbers of the rather curious AMX-13 light tank. This light tank mounted the aforementioned high-velocity 75mm, making it a fast, nimble, and excellent little tank killer. Rate of fire, however, was actually really slow, as the gun's mount was solidly built straight into the turret, so that the whole turret had to elevate and depress on this bizarre kind of ball and gimbal joint uh, in order to adjust for elevation and range. In all, Israeli Defense Forces, or the IDF as they're usually called, their tank force in 1956 was hardly the steel-plated juggernaut that it would become in subsequent decades. We're looking at second and third hand Shermans, only moderately upgraded at this point, and a few post-war light tanks. The IDF chief of staff at this time, the famous Moshe Dayan, felt that tanks were a heavy, unwieldy, and expensive arm of the service. And he actually preferred to prioritize airstrike operations, special forces, and air mobile operations. The Israelis also used large numbers of World War II American-made M3 half-tracks, both as infantry transports and mortar carriers. This wasn't universal, though. Often the Israelis had to resort to trucks, which performed very badly off-road in the Sinai sands. There were no infantry anti-tank weapons, really. The closest we see are French-supplied 106mm recoilless rifles. There were also a lot of Italian base uh, light machine guns hanging around, and wartime British 25-pounders for regimental artillery support. Next, let's take a look at the Egyptians. So the Egyptians of 1956 were hardly the all-Soviet nightmare that we were going to see in later wars. In fact, their equipment was probably as diverse and scrapped together as the Israelis at this point. They were still using a number of the same British Enfield rifles, mortars, and machine guns, supplemented by a range of Soviet-made and knockoff semi-automatic 7.62mm rifles, much like the SKS. Soviet battalion and regimental mortars, that's 82 and 120mm, were also in use, along with a handful of American 81mm. There were also trucks and a rather large number of Soviet BTR-152 APCs. Uh, these are really just enclosed armored trucks. Anti-tank capability was made up of Czechoslovakian 107mm recoilless rifles and British 17-pounders left over from the wartime protectorate period. Artillery support was usually supplied by the same British 25-pounders used by the Israelis. The majority of the Egyptian tanks were, believe it or not, more Shermans, specifically British Sherman 3s, still with the original 75mm short barrel dual purpose gun. Now there was one brigade equipped with Soviet T-34 85s, along with an armored anti-tank unit of SU-100 tank destroyers, probably the biggest anti-tank guns on the Sinai battlefield. Fortunately for the Israelis, these were deployed far behind the front and really only saw action at Bir Givkafa in the closing phases of the war. More immediately, the Egyptians fielded British wartime Archer tank destroyers, which is basically a stripped-down Valentine chassis with an open mantlet mounting the 17-pounder anti-tank gun. These would see significant combat at Abu Aguila, Kusiyama, and Umm Katif, easily the largest battles of the Sinai War. When it comes to actually wargaming the Sinai War of 1956, players are going to have a range of options, usually depending on what level of conflict they'd like to recreate. Starting at the top, so to speak, a full-scale operational level wargame of this conflict can be found with Operation Kadesh, the 1956 Suez Crisis, by Paul Rohrbach at High Flying Dice Games. The game presents a map not only of the entire Sinai, but also the West Bank border regions with Jordan. This allows players to balance diversionary operations, like the assault on Kakilia, against the main assault on PLA and Fedayeen positions in the Gaza Strip, and Egyptian army positions along the Negev border and extending deeper into the Sinai. So not only do players have to win with military victory points, but also diplomatic victory points all while keeping a wary eye on British and French operations and superpower involvement with the United States and the Soviet Union. 
As the Egyptian player, you are badly outmatched by the Israelis militarily, but if you can slow their advance long enough, international furor will build up and compel them to withdrawal before the Israelis can attain all their objectives, leaving the Egyptians with a victory. As with any higher level game in a modern era, it is all too possible to win a military victory while suffering a diplomatic or public relations defeat. Next we look at the command tactical level, where players engage on a smaller tactical battlefield, but where each game piece represents a unit rather than an individual man or vehicle. For this level, there is only one clear choice, and that's Avalon Hill's The Arab Israeli Wars. My friend Damon Brentall and I have played not one, but two 1956 Sinai War scenarios in preparation for this video. The first of these pitted the Israeli 7th Armored Brigade, equipped with M1 Shermans and 50 Sherman upgrades with the high velocity French 75mm gun and a handful of AMX-13 light tanks, against the southern shoulder of the Egyptian positions at Abu Aguila. Supported by two battalions of armored Israeli infantry of 4th Brigade, this combined force ran into a dug-in defense of Egyptians of the 6th Brigade 3rd Infantry Division on the first day of the war. A fast breakthrough here was imperative, as the frontal Israeli attack against Abu Aguila, uh, that's carried out by 10th Brigade a few miles to the north, was really starting to fail. Now this southern flanking attack, originally planned as a supporting maneuver, had to carry the day by attacking Abu Aguila from the side and rear. Notably, this is where we see the use of Egyptian Archer tank destroyers up against Israeli Shermans. The outcome of these Abu Aguila engagements are critical. Only by winning here and winning fast can the Israelis open the roads leading deeper into the Sinai and relieve those paratroopers that have dropped at the Mitla Pass, the gateway across the spine of the Sinai and leading to the approaches toward the Suez Canal. We also had a game recreating another engagement near the end of the war on November 2nd. Here, that same Israeli 7th Armored Brigade, uh, they're now on their own and they've now pushed almost to the Suez Canal, are engaged by the Egyptian 1st Armored Brigade in a straight out tank duel near the Sinai crossroads at Bir Gifkafu. This was the largest tank battle of the Sinai War, with over 100 machines in all engaged, and saw the Israeli Shermans and AMX 13s engage Egyptian T-34 85s and SU-100 tank destroyers, uh, definitely the heaviest armored units in the Sinai at this time. For players keen on miniature play, the natural choice seems to be Battlefront's Fate of a Nation, their Arab Israeli War series. However, where the original release focused primarily on the 1967 Six Day War, and the new release commendably adds the 1973 Yom Kippur War, the 1956 war seems to be more or less left out. No worries at all, players can easily recreate these battles using late war, flames of war releases. Israeli M1 Shermans can be approximated using the stats and miniatures for US M4A3 E8 or the Easy 8 Shermans. The M50 Shermans can be sort of kitbashed, uh, rules wise, by using the firepower, penetration, and range values of a late war Panther tank on an up armored late war Sherman hull. And of course, Flames of War trucks and M3 half tracks can take care of Israeli infantry transport. For the Egyptians, SU 100s, T 3485s, and British Sherman 3s, I mean, obviously they have you covered. Both sides used plenty of 25 pounders for off board artillery, and the Egyptians used Archer tank destroyers and towed 17 pounders for anti tank guns, easily available in the Flames of War range. AMX 13s might be the only tough unit to create rules wise, but again, these tanks were still being used in 1967 so the Fate of a Nation release should have you covered there as well. Lastly, for players interested in the infantry side of the war, British or American paratroopers out of bolt action or chain of command can provide a great starting point for Israeli paratroopers that landed at Mila Pass. This is definitely one of the most legendary battles of the 1956 war. Egyptians can be recreated by using late war Soviets. Just arm your troops mostly with semi-automatic rifles rather than PPSH, SMGs and the like. Uh, avoid the temptation to fill your ranks with STG-44s. 
This is a nice bolt action equivalent to the AK-47 I've seen some players use. Uh, Egyptian infantry platoons didn't really start using AKM family assault rifles heavily until the 1967 war. Of course, Force on Force and other more purpose-built modern era war games can also be used to recreate infantry battles in the 1956 Sinai War. Just keep both of your forces as regulars. In Force on Force, I'd say the Israelis would probably be troop quality 8, and for the Egyptians I would use a 6. Unless you're interested in the attacks further north against Rafah and Khan Yunus in the Gaza Strip. Here, the PLA Fedayeen might be better represented as irregular forces, as specified in the Force on Force rules. Historically, Operations Kadesh and Musketeer were both very successful. The Israeli part of the war is often called the Hundred Hours War, uh, since it took them just a hundred hours to smash the Egyptian army in the Sinai and take practically the entire peninsula. British and French operations at Port Said and extending down into the Suez Canal were also very successful. Although the Egyptians were able to sink hundreds of block ships in the canal and basically close the waterway for months. Diplomatically, however, this unlikely coalition would be bitterly disappointed in the results of their endeavors. In a rare episode of 1950s Cold War agreement and cooperation, the U.S. and Soviet Union actually united shoulder to shoulder in their condemnation and opposition to these invasions, especially against the British and the French. This superpower cooperation was actually pretty important since the 1956 Hungarian Revolt was also taking place almost at the exact same time, and the military and political situation in Central Europe was hardly steady at the moment. But they did cooperate, Nasser would remain in power, and the FLN would eventually topple the French out of Algeria. The British suffered a deep blow to their international prestige, and Operation Musketeer is often seen as just another step in the sunset of the British Empire. And while the Israelis did clear the Fedayeen out of the Sinai for a time, UN peacekeeping troops were eventually compelled to withdraw from the Sinai. The Egyptian army was soon back in the region, I mean this is part of Egypt after all, but it did spark the fuse for the next Arab-Israeli war that would start in 1967. So I really hope you've enjoyed this first episode of the Op Center. I'd like to thank Damon Brentoff for the great games of Arab-Israeli wars, and also for his help in clarifying some of the technical details on Israeli armor. He is deeply knowledgeable and well-read on what is definitely a confusing topic. So, what do you think of the 1956 Sinai War? How would you game some of these battles? And what do you think of running World War II armies and systems in these early post-war conflicts like this? I'd also like to start a Q&A segment in these videos where I'll select a question posted by one of you to answer in our next video. So if you'd like to get involved, and if there's anything you'd like to know about modern warfare gaming in general, just drop it in the comments and maybe we'll get to it in a future video. Come back next time when we take a look at the next Arab-Israeli conflict, the Six-Day War of 1967. Meanwhile, you can follow us on Facebook, on Tabletop.com, and Podbean. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, and please support us on Patreon. With just a small donation, you can help this platform keep progressing to the next level and keep bringing you more great modern wargaming content. So that's going to wrap us up for today, everyone. This is Ariskany, and Tango Mike for listening.